Santosh Kumar I've known for many, many years. He's at the University of Memphis. Um, he was in his early days of computer science and mathematics, was an NSF grantee, um, was then an OpNet grantee in some of the early days of OpNet, and then subsequently um, became a grantee of the um, of the uh, Big Data to Knowledge Initiative and has a very large project there um, looking at the use of mobile technologies uh, for uh, being able to automatically detect and sense things like smoking and congestive heart failure and a number of other phenomena. So with that, Santosh, I'm going to turn this over to you and thank you very much for presenting today. Thank you, Bill, for a very kind introduction. And I think I'm ready to begin. All right, so if, uh, uh, and, uh, I have known Bill for, uh, I think, by now, about 10 years. Uh, we first met at the 2000, in 2007, the launch of Genes Environment and Health Initiative. And so it has been a long journey that we have done together in the area of mobile health. So what I want to talk today uh, is uh, to make a case for collecting high-frequency raw sensor data uh, when conducting research with mobile sensors. So uh, first I would like to give a brief introduction to MD2K. So MD2K is, uh, is a multidisciplinary initiative. It's a collaboration of 12 institutions and it covers various aspects. So it truly represents a team science initiative where we have investigators from computer science, electrical engineering, behavioral health, as well as medicine. Uh, we are uh, very fortunate to have some amazing people uh, from across all dis disciplines represented. So next let me uh, launch into the area of mobile sensors and what it can do for measurement. So there are a variety of different uh, sensors that uh, exist and many more are emerging. So mobile phones that many of us carry with ourselves that has many sensors in it. Then the smart watches or activity trackers that we wear on wrists, they have several sensors on them. And the difference from mobile phones is that they touch our body as well as they are from, uh, they can track our hand gestures. Then there are chest bands that can track the electrical activity of the heart as well as breathing activity of the lungs. Then eyeglasses that can look into the eyes to uh, measure health, health aspects of the wearer as well as they can look outwards and uh, help track the visual exposure of the, in, of the wearer. From this we can, uh, from these sensors we can uh, measure a variety of different exposures, so geo exposures, uh, exposures to say alcohol so often, or bars or tobacco outlets, burns exposures to pollution, exposures to, uh, to various places that we uh, move about. And then they can measure behaviors as well. So with uh, activity trackers, we can measure sedentary behaviors, physical activity. Uh, with hand gesture uh, monitoring, we can, mo we can track uh, eating activities. With say, heart rate monitoring, uh, one can measure say cocaine usage. Uh, from, from breathing activity, we can mo monitor uh, speaking methods, uh, and uh, there are alcohol sensors that can be integrated into the smartwatches as well. So uh, we talked about the sensors being able to measure exposures that can represent risk factors. We talked about measuring exposures that can also represent risk factors. And then uh, we, these sensors, they can also help measure some of the outcomes. So whether, I mean, driving uh, from an induced stress on a particular morning uh, when driving on the DC Beltway, uh, you can monitor that because you can monitor both the commuting episode as well as the stress uh, if you are wearing a a sensor that can measure heart rate variability. Uh, some sensors they can monitor uh, or track the changes in the fluid in uh, uh, fluid for lung condition. We can also measure depressive symptoms. Uh, uh, we can uh, have, we have now electrodermal sensors that can uh, monitor panic attacks. The smart toothbrushes that have uh, plaque uh, monitoring in, embedded in them. So. What I have tried to show on this slide, uh, it's a pretty populated slide, but what I've tried to show is the power of mobile sensors as a 
various risk factors as well as the outcomes. And together, I think what they enable is uh, to, for early detection of an adverse health event so that appropriate action can be taken. And then since they can measure both the change in the health status as well as the risk factors, they, we can identify uh, the antecedents and precipitants of adverse health, health events. And if so, that can be used to predict and then intervene so as to prevent an adverse health event from occurring. And finally, because these sensors not only can measure the risk factors and the health of state, they can also measure the state an individual is in. For example, if the individual is driving, that may not be the best time to ask them to do deep breathing or to do, do a relaxation exercise. So, by, uh, I mean, so they, these sensors allow uh, the mobile interventions to be context adaptive. And also, since we can monitor the effect of intervention, we can also monitor compliance. So those can be used to further personalize the interventions to the individual. So um, uh, following this paradigm, in MD2K, we are trying to, the technologies that we are developing that I'll shortly talk about. We are showcasing that this technology is widely applicable in, uh, for two different health conditions. One is the smoking cessation. Uh, where we are using uh, wrist warm sensors and the respiration sensor to detect first lapses in smoking. And if uh, I mean that itself leads to early detection, so if we can detect first lapse, an intervention could perhaps be launched so as to help, help the uh, I mean, newly abstinent smoker to continue to be abstinent and not lapse into the second or third time. We can also look at all the geo-exposure data, we can look at the stress measurements and variety of other, other risk factors and see which ones uh, I mean, led to a lapse for in, uh, different individuals and use that or feed that into just-in-time intervention that can be prompted on the mobile phone. The second application that we are, uh, we are applying this technology is, is the congestive heart failure. It's a little different in terms of temporal reality. Here, uh, I mean, the urgent. So in this case, we have an easy sense sensor that uh, tracks the, it uses the micro radar sensors developed by Emory Urgent at Ohio State, and that uh, tracks the uh, fluid level in the lungs, and uh, that by its lead to early detection, and uh, that can lead to, ch uh, that can help uh, the healthcare provider to change the diuretic doses and help prevent readmission. Prediction prevention by monitoring the changes uh, I mean, in the lung fluid volume uh, after, uh, say, fast food eating or, uh, or after inactivity. The information can be reflected back to the individual so they can directly see the effect of these risk factors on their own congestion level and the increasing risk for hospitalization, and perhaps that can help uh, predict, uh, predict and prevent uh, rehospitalization even before it reaches to the dangerous, uh, I mean, uh, close level uh, that requires the readmission. And uh, I mean, uh, so again, mobile phones can, uh, can be used not only to change or communicate with the, with, uh, facilitate communication between the patient and the provider that can be based on the data collected by sensors, but that can also be used to deliver interventions uh, to the participants or to the patients. So, uh, <clears throat> The sensors that we are using in MD2K, uh, there are a variety of them. Uh, the chest, uh, those sensors that are worn at the chest level, uh, those that measure blood pressure and, uh, and weight, and those that measure hand gestures. And then I talked about the easy sense that tracks the fluid condition. And also as part of some other projects, we have connect, uh, connected the, uh, the, our mobile phone software to the smart toothbrushes. So all of these sensors, they can stream data continuously to the mobile phone framework that was developed by MD2K, and uh, that helps us uh, collect this raw sensor data reliably and continuously in the natural field environment. So what I want to do next is I want to uh, make a case that when doing research, as opposed to collecting only the assays or the, or the biomarkers, that we should seriously consider collecting the raw sensor data, which comes at much higher frequency. So 
uh, rather, uh, so there are several activity trackers in the market. Uh, I mean, they are meant for consumers. Sometimes they are used in research as well. But the disadvantage of using the activity trackers that have a built-in uh, model for producing biomarker is similar to when, uh, I mean, in, say, biomedical research, we collect samples blood samples or saliva samples, and we do an assay on that, right, I mean, for, that re for uh, the time of collection, and after that, the samples are discarded. So that does not allow us to go back and reprocess the sample to do a new assay or to go validate the, the assay that we had applied previously. Whereas uh, I mean, the approach of creating Biobank is that we have an option to go back and reprocess those uh, those uh, I mean, fluid specimens or or the I mean, tissue specimen or the <clears throat> uh, so uh, the the same approach of biobank can be applied to create digibank. <laughs> So what we mean is that I mean, when collecting the sensor data, instead of just collecting the biomarkers directly, uh, we collect the raw sensor data. By doing so, many things can happen. First, it can help lead to development of new biomarkers, help, lead, help uh, validate the biomarkers that have previously been developed. It can lead to improvement in biomarkers. And uh, I mean, uh, all of this can go back to the biomedical research, uh, I mean, uh, which can lead to identification of even newer biomarkers. So data collected today can be reprocessed five years later when biomarkers that we don't even envision today can become available, or the same biomarker that we are using today, a much more validated or improved biomarker models can become available, uh, available a few years from now. Hello? So average. Hello? This rapid advancement in the data science research collect okay. from. I'll provide several examples. Uh, those of you on the phone, could you mute, please? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you so much for the reminder. Yes, you're welcome. Have a great day. You too. Bye. <laughs> Unbelievable. Thank you all for muting. Okay, Santos, take it away. Right. Okay. So I'm going to give you several examples how following this approach of collecting raw sensor data has helped us to develop, improve, and reprocess the data that we collected several years ago. So we have um, been able to develop biomarkers of stress from physiological arousal of smoking from hand gestures and respiration, of cocaine use from the heart rate data, conversation from the respiration data, and then uh, several other biomarkers that are currently in the process of being developed uh, that relate to eating, uh, for which several models already exist, then for craving, uh, for which also uh, a model exists preliminary model exists, then brushing, which is under development, then visual exposure from the eyeglasses of the advertisements or fast, uh, of fast food or of, of, or of uh, tobacco or of uh, alcohol. And then uh, um, assessment of the eye to measure, measure fatigue. And then uh, I talked about the lung fluid condition, and then from GPS due exposures to fast food as, as well as tobacco outlets. So there are several markers that uh, are in the process of being developed, or some models of it already exist. And so next I will briefly describe or briefly talk about some of these, uh, these biomarkers and to showcase as to how collecting raw sensor data has helped us uh, to make these advances. So first, for uh, say a smoking cessation, so uh, to give you a sense, uh, in a smoking, uh, if, if our goal was to detect the first lapse in smoking cessation. Uh, this problem, uh, I mean, we started working on this uh, in I think 2007. That was the launch of Teens Environment and Health Initiative, when several of individuals uh, from, uh, expressed a desire that there be a, uh, there be a model or way to detect this first lapse in the smoking cessation from sensor data, which is has been dominated by asking participants to self-report. That doesn't pro uh, lead to an accurate timing of uh, I mean, of when actually the first lapse happened. So if it, this is to be done, there are several challenges. One, each puff when uh, smoking a cigarette lasts about three to four seconds. Uh, 
Whereas the sensor that is, I mean, that people wear, they are worn for the entire day, which are tens of thousands of seconds. So similarly, if we are looking for the P, a, a unique pattern in respiration or deep breathing, deep inhalation and exhalation breathing to detect, say, a puff, there are 10,000 breaths uh, that we take in 10 hours. Out of those, we have very few, six to seven instances are the ones that represent uh, I mean, first lapse. Uh, similarly, if we, are, if we want to use the hand-to-mouth gestures to detect uh, the act of smoking, there are about 2,000 times that people usually take their hand-to-mouth uh, in, in, in that 10 hours of sensor wearing. So again, from this vast amount of data, being able to accurately identify those uh, six, seven positive instances of the puffs that usually happen on the first lapse day is pretty challenging. And then if you consider other issues, like uh, different people hold cigarette differently. Uh, same person, when they smoke while seated, it's a different hand-to-mouth gesture. When they are walking, it's a different hand-to-mouth gesture. When they are talking, uh, there are several hand-to-mouth gestures even during that episode uh, for talking that is not about a smoking. And then uh, when, there are, uh, when people are driving and smoking, there are different hand movements that are involved, and then the hand is pretty close to mouth already. So, uh, so there are several challenges. And then if you think about other events that happen during the day, like drinking, or, uh, I mean, drinking uh, soda, or drinking water, or eating, uh, all of those involve hand-to-mouth gestures as well. So developing such a model has been challenging, but fortunately, with, uh, with uh, great effort from, from amazing students that we are blessed to have, uh, uh, we developed a model for uh, detecting the smoking using both hand-to-mouth gestures and the breathing pattern. We developed this model uh, in la uh, last year, 2015, and uh, uh, we at, by that time, we had a data collection for a smoking, on a smoking cessation data set in the OpNet project that Bill mentioned at the, at the start of this uh, webinar. And after developing this model, we were able to uh, go back and apply this smoking model to detect the first lapses on this data collection. So the collection, uh, um, so the de uh, development of this model happened on a very different data set for, on six daily, sm uh, daily smokers, but we were able to take this model and apply it on 61 newly abstained smokers who wore the sensors for one day pre-quit and three day post-quit. And the model was able to successfully detect 28 out of the 33 lapses, first lapses that happened. And uh, there were five cases when it did not detect, and I will talk shortly about that. And the false alarm rate uh, was about one false episode every six days. So things, I mean, there are several things that this model still does not do. Uh, so out of the 33, uh, only 28 were detected. In the remaining five, either the sensor was not warm, so a participant got up and didn't put, up the, put on the sensor before they lapsed, or the data quality was poor because of the data losses. So, uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that the se the sensor-based model uh, first, if you develop this model and if you have a data set collected, even 10 years ago, if you did collect this raw sensor data, you can take this model or any subsequent improvement of it, and you can apply it on that data set and be able to find the accurate timing of the first lap. Second, uh, there are several ways that this model needs to improve. Right now, this model does not adapt, uh, is not suitable for e-cigarettes, which, which involves a different smoking pattern. And in future, when this model is improved for, uh, or is adapted for e-cigarettes, again, we will be able to go back to our data set that we collected in 2014, and we'll be able to apply it and to find out if there were any smoking uh, episodes involving e-cigarettes that, that this model missed. The second example I'll provide is that of, um, of inferring cocaine use from the heart rate data. And this was also done in the Genes, Environment, and Health Initiative in collaboration with Casey Preston at uh, NIDA Intramural Program. Uh, so uh, for this uh, detection, for this modeling purposes, uh, we had a lab study at Johns Hopkins with Annie Umbrist. 
And in that, we had uh, participants who uh, who were spending 44 days in a residential facility, and they were uh, they had intravenous. Uh, administration, self-administration of hooking in the lab, which was limited to about 40 mg or so. And so we used that data to develop a model. And then we were able to apply it to a data set where we had six, uh, where we had uh, I mean, uh, uh, cocaine users, about 38 or 40 uh, illicit or uh, uh, polydrug users who wore the sensors for four weeks in the field. And that uh, data collection started in, two, in 2012. And so after we developed this model, we were able to apply it on the data collection that happened before the model was developed. So the challenges in developing this model and why it took, it took quite a bit of effort and time is that in the lab, uh, we, uh, the administration of cocaine was limited to 40 mg. It was mostly intravenous. But in the field, people took up to 600 mg of cocaine. They, uh, they use various other modalities, not just IV, like ingestion or smoking. Uh, and then in the, free, in the lab, when people uh, uh, were self-administering co uh, administering cocaine, they were seated in a, on a chair or they were still not physically active, whereas in the field, uh, people walk around together with I mean, taking cocaine or immediately after taking cocaine. So our goal was to detect the cocaine response from the increase in the heart rate activity. But increase, similar increase in the heart rate activity also uh, I mean, uh, happens in response to physical activity. So that was pretty challenging. And so, but we did develop a, a model uh, that was able to uh, detect of all the 27 detectable uses of cocaine in this field data set and uh, with a false alarm rate of about one per day. So the key here uh, in, tr in distinguishing from physical activity, uh, mind you, I mean, these participants had, uh, from, uh, were wearing the chest sensor so that collected the ECG as well as the uh, activity from accelerometry. So if the activity did not happen concurrently with cocaine, then we could just look at the accelerometry and, and detect, okay, when, when the heart rate increase is due to activity, then we should not run a model of cocaine. But, uh, but as I mentioned, that how in, in the physical activity happens concurrently with cocaine uses. So therefore, we could not rule out or we could not suspend uh, or discard the, the exclude the data uh, where physical activity was present. So to, uh, I mean, what we did was we developed a physiologically informed model that modeled the response of the autonomic nervous system to cocaine usage. So in particular, what happens is that when there is only physical activity and no cocaine, then after the physical activity is stopped, then the body has a chance to recover. The parasympathetic nervous system is the one that is mostly active to try to bring the body or physiology back to normal. But when uh, cocaine is also happens to be in the bloodstream, then uh, even after the physical activity stops, during the recovery period, the recovery is slower because even during the recovery period when the physical activity has stopped, uh, the, the sympathetic nervous system is still active because of the cocaine, and therefore it delays or slows the recovery of the physiology. And that change in the recovery rate is what we uh, what we try to detect to distinguish when uh, the, there is uh, cocaine in the bloodstream or not. So again, in this case, as I mentioned, we developed this model uh, in 2014, but we were able to apply to the data collected that was in from 2012. And that was, again, because we collected the raw sensor data. And next I'll describe that we were able to apply several other models to the same data set that we developed much more recently in 2016, so even five years, I mean, four years later. So, so what I'm going to describe next is, uh, thus far I talked about uh, developing of, development of markers. Next I'm going to talk about how, you, how we go from sensors to markers to interventions which is uh, the full scale of the mobile sensor big data. So first is, I mean, being able to collect all this raw sensor data, and then uh, that leads to about millions of samples per day. Uh, once we apply the biomarker models, then say for stress, we have uh, a, a data point for every minute. 
just likelihood. Similarly, for physical activity, we have uh, some data for every 10 seconds. So, from, I mean, by, ready, by applying the biomarker models, we go from uh, raw sensor data, uh, which is millions of samples, to biomarkers, which are thousands of samples per day. But then, if we are going to trigger just-in-time interventions based on these values of biomarkers, then we have thousands of samples per day, but the number of interventions that people or, I mean, or the participants will be able to tolerate will be in single digits. I don't think that many would, would, uh, be, would be receptive if we triggered them with interventions and asked them to do something uh, 10 times a day or more. So from these 4,000 or I mean, thousands of samples, we need to select those few, uh, very few, one to two inter uh, one to two opportune moments when an intervention should be delivered. So after developing this model for biomarkers, the next challenge is to be able to identify those opportune moments from this time series of biomarkers when an intervention should be delivered. So I mean, so uh, the. Uh, I will take the example of the stress here. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, so we developed a model called C stress. Uh, this is an improvement of a model that we had developed in 2011. So in this uh, model, what the approach we take is the <clears throat> we collect data on both respiration and the ECG. Uh, from which we uh, from ECG we uh, in, uh, we compute the intro beat interval. And the, uh, we collected data in the lab where we people went through public speaking, mental arithmetic, and cold pressure at the University of Minnesota with Mustafa Alasi, uh, <clears throat> under the leadership of Mustafa Alasi. And uh, <clears throat> so after uh, we collect the data in the lab, we uh, there is a debate as to I mean when is someone stressed? So should we should we trust the self report? And is that what should be used as the gold standard? Uh, and uh, it's, it is still is debatable, uh, and I will get to the issue of self-report. So from the lab, since we are we use the these validated stressors, we use those minutes when uh, the, uh, that corresponds to the data collected when participants were under this lab stress test, like public speaking, mental arithmetic, or cold pressure, as those minutes when the physiology exhibits the stress response, and the rest periods as non-stress. So with that, we developed, uh, we trained this model. Uh, that and <clears throat> what we found is that by uh, incorporating several features such as the uh, ATS percentile of intravenous intervals, in addition to the heart rate variability, we are able to get much better accuracy. So if you see in the first column, uh, the second column of the top table, you'll see that the F1 score. If we use all the features. Uh, even with ECG, is much better. It's 0.78 compared to 0.56 if we use use harsh heart rate variability alone. Mm -hmm. So this is the lab data. Uh, then we apply uh, I mean, to apply this model in the field setting, which is where this will be highly useful. Uh, the only gold standard we can collect is the self-report. So in order to match the stress likelihood obtained from C stress to the self-report collected in the in the field setting, we use the Bayesian network model to map C stress onto the self-reported stress data to account for uh, changes in the rates of activation of physiology uh, and uh, the uh, and the perception of the stress in the mind. So we, I mean, especially, uh, I mean, in particular, what we observe is that if there is a big, uh, I mean, a stress event, the physiology will show, show a strong response, but physiology may recover quite quickly, whereas the perception of stress may linger on for the mind. So, to uh, to capture this differences in the in the decay and and the activation, uh, we use the Bayesian, Bayesian network model. What we did is that uh, I mean, we obtained, uh, we took the, all the self-report provided by each participant, and then we took, uh, took the model's output, so C stress model's output for that participant, and we, uh, we tried to predict the self-report that the person would provide at each point when they did provide the self-report, and that's what we tried to match. And so, uh, I mean, so what you see at the table at the bottom is the results from 
uh, applying this model to the field data of 30 uh, of uh, 23 participants when they wore the sensor for seven days in the field. These are different set of participants who participated in the lab study. And so we uh, see a median F1 score of 0.71. Then we applied this model again uh, in that uh, drug user data set that I just talked about. Uh, that was collected I mean, in two, uh, from 2012. And uh, here also we see a median F1 score of about 0.72. And what, uh, so uh, there is differences in the, in the F1 score for each participant. And what we observe is that, see, for the last five participants whose, uh, whose uh, I mean, F1 score was the lowest, we see that the cons internal consistency in the self-report itself was pretty low. So I mean, the, mo the model output or performance is limited to the internal consistency between the, uh, I mean, between the self-report items of the stress itself. And therefore, one, different, one observation I want to make is that when we talk about objective uh, uh, events, such as, uh, say, smoking or eating or physical activity, if there was a camera or there was some way to to detect whether that event happened or not, it can be said uh, in, in most in many cases unambiguously whether an eating eating uh, event happened or not, or whether there was a smoking cough or not. Whereas for for such subjective phenomena or or, or diffuse phenomena as stress, uh, there isn't a uh, hundred percent unambiguous inference of when a stress is occurring and when not. So especially when we infer these with self-report. So this will be the case for stress, for craving, any such phenomena for which self-report is the only available gold standard. So, so for such phenomena, we can't expect the uh, accuracy to be higher than the internal consistency of self-report, which is usually limited to 0.8 or if the internal consistency was limited to 0.8. Applied this model uh, also to the smoking cessation data set, and here we observe that the, the F1 score is lower. And when, when we dug deeper, we found that the overall Cronbach alpha for this study was was much lower at 0 0.76. So, uh, so again, I mean, uh, the accuracy can't be higher than that. And here the median F1. Score. So how we go from this marker time series to the intervention. So what you see here is the output from the model, the stress model, about the stress likelihood. And you see one binary threshold. From the model as the stress. And if the value, if the likelihood is lower than that, that will be classified as not stressed. And you can, as you can expect from any machine learning model, that there are, uh, uh, there are in. Uh, so now this is stress likelihood, so we have a value for every minute when data is collected, thousands of samples. So what we do is that this uh, C stress, uh, by applying the C stress model to the entire day's worth of data. So we treat this uh, this more like a, I mean, uh, a, a flowing uh, flowing uh, series of data or time series of data, and we identify the, uh, the the episodes, so rise and fall, that happen after smoothing the data set a little bit, and that's what we uh, we call an episode. And then for the in, for this episode, some could be I mean pretty uh, tall, uh, but uh, but fleeting. Others could be I mean could be wide, but not as high. So that's the metric we uh, we use to characterize an episode. And then uh, I mean, if we want to deliver intervention, we have several choices. We can have either a proactive intervention, that means try to deliver intervention when we suspect a stress episode is about to occur, or we can uh, deliver a reactive intervention when the stress uh, level is near its peak, the point C, or that the stress episode has just been over. And <clears throat> So to, in order to train a model for uh, of what these thresholds should be to deliver the intervention, what we do is that we go back to the lab data that we had collected in University of Minnesota uh, for, uh, under this public speaking arithmetic and cold presser. And this time, we uh, compute the stress density from the C-stress output 
And then we use two thresholds in this case, I mean here, instead of one threshold that we had used previously. The reason for two thresholds is that now we have very few opportunities to deliver intervention. And we really want to be certain that those are the right moments to deliver intervention. So we want to classify this, I mean, the, uh, when the person is stressed with a desired confidence, and similarly not stressed with a desired confidence. And so every other output that will fall in between will be unsure and will not be acted upon. So, I mean, uh, what we show here is that uh, uh, the first one is the, is the fully reactive intervention when after the stress episode is over, then we want to deliver intervention. And if so, if we want a precision and recall of both of 95%, then what we show are what, what the thresholds are. And in that case, how many stress episodes per, per day is what we observe when we apply these thresholds to the smoking cessation data set. And similarly, we repeat that for other uh, precision recall values. And when we look for precision recall values of 85%, then basically both thresholds become one. And in that case, there is no more of unsure, uh, unsure episodes. And we can do the same for the, for, uh, for, uh, for the reactive intervention when we want to deliver intervention when people are still, uh, they have just had a peak level of stress. So again, the, uh, the lesson here is we were able to do all this on the data sets that we had collected previously because we had collected the raw sensor data. So, so therefore, again, summarizing that uh, we, would, uh, we would like to argue for uh, uh, um, everyone who is listening in and who wants to collect uh, mobile sensor data that we would urge you to consider collecting the raw sensor data that can greatly improve the uh, uh, useful life of the data that you collect today. So uh, to help provide the support for collecting uh, this raw sensor data, which comes at a very high frequency, MD2K has developed a software platform. This is called mCerebrum. Uh, this can be installed on the Android smartphones. And this has capability to connect to a variety of different high rate, high rate, uh, high data rate sensors, as well as low data rate sensors such as toothbrush or I mean, uh, blood pressure and, and weight sensors. All of these sensors, they send data wirelessly and they can send concurrently and the platform is capable of collecting 70 million samples per day. And, and this has been tested and it is, it, it is, it is currently being deployed. And uh, using a variety of different wireless radios, whether it's Bluetooth or whether it's low power Bluetooth or ANT radios. And then what happens is the platform assesses the quality of the data that is coming in in real time. Uh, to be able to prompt the participants uh, so that they can fix any sensor attachment that may have come loose. After that, uh, there is a privacy controller that can that allows participants to suspend data collection for a given amount of time for any specific sensors. And then, uh, I mean, uh, all the data that is collected, we apply machine learning, uh, the respective machine learning models to infer a variety of biomarkers that I talked about right on the phone itself, and which can then be used to trigger either self-report or interventions. And then all of this data can be uh, 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 securely shared over the cloud uh, to, uh, to a data repository. So the key capabilities of mCerebrum is that it supports very high frequency streaming data. Uh, it can connect to a variety of different sensors and radio. Uh, I mean, it has continuous data quality monitoring and supports real-time computation of biomarkers. And then it can uh, I mean, be used to uh, trigger notification or interventions. Right now, uh, this is in the process of being deployed uh, across uh, <clears throat> uh, across this, this seven sites, uh, from which we expect to, I mean, of over more than 1,000 participants, uh, from which we expect to get about uh, from close to three trillion uh, samples for 150 terabytes of data. So. Uh, from, uh, <clears throat> Another uh, another uh, recent development is that uh, thus far we talked about being able to collect the uh, collect high frequency raw sensor data, but there are several uh, researchers who may not have the time or the resources or the expertise to be able to collect the data, but they do bring several uh, I mean expertise to be able to process or advance the data science research. Only if I mean these kinds of data can be shared with them. So uh, this new uh, NSF. Uh, data cyber infrastructure project is to develop a provenance cyber infrastructure that can be used to annotate this high frequency sensor data and make it ready for sharing for third-party research. 
So I'll conclude the talk by pointing you to several resources. So all the software that has been developed in MG2K that is being developed, they're all open source. They're all freely available for, for your use for, uh, in any way that you like. And then uh, I mean, we have mHealth Hub where uh, all the videos of various lectures, whether they were done at the mHealth Training Institute or I mean, uh, over webinars, they're all archived for your use. Uh, here are pointers to various resources that is available from MD2K, and I'd like to conclude the talk. Thank you. Antosh, thanks so much. Um, just a reminder before I ask the first question, uh, those of you on the phone, we're still hearing a little typing in the background, so if anybody's um, not muted, uh, mute yourself, and then what we'll do for questions is do those to the chat room, so if you can go online on the chat room um, with a question, we'll do it that way to kind of get things started. Uh, Santos, first of all, this was great. Um, just the, um, first of all, the point about um, maintaining data in its rawest form um, so that it can be sort of reused and reanalyzed and remodeled in different ways, I think it's a really important point for people to hear. Um, and I was, uh, I, every time I hear you speak, I think I know what you're doing and then I find new things that you're doing. Um, so it was re really great to see some of the work. Um, let me just ask a question, though, as I'm waiting for people to um, enter um, questions on the chat room. The, the modeling that you're doing, for instance, on some of the stress things, are that, is that done uniquely and individually, or is there some generalizability of those stress markers across people? Or do you uh, have to model and train each one that's on its own? Uh, both. So uh, what is that uh, the model has, uh, I like to call it self-calibration built into it which means that the, all the features that goes into the model, that's personalized to each individual automatically by the normalizing it to them. So that means it adjusts to their baseline, it adjusts to their standard deviation, and so therefore each feature is normalized to each person as their data comes in. So it takes, uh, say, an hour of, of data collection on each person for the model to find their individual baselines and their reactivity. And then the, the output of the model is more and more personalized to that individual. So, in, I mean, when you start using the model for the first hour of your data, the model may not be calibrated to, to you, but after, the, after having some, uh, some amount of data, I would say about an hour uh, or so, then the model will be a lot more specific to you. Okay. All right. Interesting. But, but there is no training uh, needed, so we don't need to subject everyone to dipping their hand in ice cold water for them to be able to apply a stress <laughs> model on themselves. All right, that sounds good. Um, I'm going to depend on my um, colleagues, Bill Elwood and others, who are a little closer to the screen to read the chat as they come over. Um, API. Uh, yeah, yeah, he'll go. Okay. Santosh, has your group made the eight? available APIs to pull the raw data from the devices? Uh, yes. Uh, so for all the devices that we mentioned, for those uh, APIs, are, they are already implemented as well. Spread from the, from the MG2K website and from the GitHub repository, uh, from links, links to which appear here. And, uh, and I've seen it on the side. Also on provide like Santosh, could you wait a minute? Don May, I need you to mute your phone, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, share. Okay. Share. <laughs> okay. okay, so. Uh, I can get it there from the ground floor. Don May Lee. There we go. Okay, let's so try again. Okay, so uh, I mean, of all the sensors that we described in here, all the eight sensors, uh, eight devices for them, the APIs for I mean, uh, the APIs for collecting the raw sensor data has already been developed. It's all implemented and it's all downloaded, downloadable and configurable to use in any research project. So, as I described for these, uh, I mean, uh, these eight studies at these different sites. Uh, I mean, it required I mean, minimal configuration changes to adapt it to each of these studies. And you can see that many of them are, are I mean, some of them are quite diverse from each other. Brilliant. Uh, Sanjash, I'm going to, we have a question that came in as to whether you're developing any devices that would be able to predict relapse. 
for example, via stress measures, and provide vocal feedback to talk them from relapsing. Uh, um, while you think about that, I, I also might add on, I, uh, um, I, I didn't realize you worked with Kenzie Preston, who yes. is, uh, uh, um, and the reason I, I, I bring that up with the vocal feedback is uh, um, Kenzie likes to talk about how someday we'd like to work toward a clinician in your pocket uh, uh, that one's mobile device would indeed talk them down from relapsing. So there, you might want to draw your different data sets together that way. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, uh, we have not developed yet an intervention. Uh, what we are providing are the tools that you can use to trigger the intervention, assuming that there are people in the audience as well as in the community who, are, uh, who have a lot more expertise in creating the appropriate intervention. What this uh, software and all this technology can provide you is that to be able to decide uh, I mean, the right timing uh, to deliver that intervention. Excellent. Uh, um, what uh, you, uh, earlier you mentioned? Uh, I think perhaps you had a one-third uh, um, non-compliance rate with the the chest strap. Do do you have other stories uh, of incidents about uh, problems with people wearing the devices or uh, um, keeping the, their sensors near or on them? to obtain the data in a consistent stream? Uh, yes, so if you compare the, the amount of data that we lost in the cocaine study uh, from, that was done in 2012 time frame to the smoking cessation study that was done in 2014 time frame, uh, the, the number of instances when the sensors were not worn at the time of first lapse were much lower, five out of 33 compared to uh, 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 more than 50% uh, of the episodes of cocaine use that was not captured by sensors. So what the lesson for us is that we are moving from asking people to wear a sensor on their chest to just wearing a smartwatch, but to be able to obtain the heart rate variability data from the smartwatch itself so that it's a much more convenient sensor that can be used and deployed a lot more widely and still be able to obtain measures of stress, smoking, eating, physical activity, sleep, uh, all from this one conveniently wearable device. That also would seem to uh, be very cross-generational friendly as well compared to uh, other means of collecting those data. Is, is my speculation uh, what on do you target mean by, or no? What do you mean by cross-generational? Uh, that, that smart watches uh, might appeal to people who are relatively young in life and all through senior citizens who uh, um, who would be who are accustomed to wearing watches, but yes. may use those jitterbug phones they advertise on TV rather than an Android or an iPhone. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I should also mention that again, what I'm talking or what the case I'm trying to make is uh, a distinction between a device that's used in research studies versus a consumer device. Consumer devices are uh, suitably and appropriately uh, optimized for collecting biomarkers that can be used for people's own uh, self-monitoring self health and wellness. Uh, whereas the, I mean, uh, the case I'm making is, but during research studies, it's useful to use those devices that will have the ability to provide raw sensor data rather than the biomarkers only. Right. So that's one last question I think we have on the chat, and then we'll need to stop. Right. Uh, um, what Interventions, kind of interventions, do you see in the future once uh, um, uh, the, we're, we're able to to tell people that ooh you're you're encountering a trigger or whoops we've detected you puffing uh, um, are you indeed relapsing into cigarette smoking what sort of interventions do you see eventually emerging from this? Yeah, so I, I mean, I usually think of interventions as three kinds. Uh, first is those that will be delivered in response to an early detection of an adverse event. So this, I mean, for a smoking, it, it will be in response to detecting first lapse. 
The second intervention uh, that, uh, that I uh, that I anticipate are, is more in the realm of pre uh, preventive. In that case, uh, when, uh, when uh, during during say the uh, the abstinence phase, uh, we help people manage their craving. We help people manage their stress, and that's why become uh, become less and less likely to relapse due to those. So improve their coping capabilities. So those for those interventions, I envision two kinds. One kind is those that require the active help or active involvement of the person when they are shown or known to be fully, I mean, physically, mentally, and socially available. The the third kind is that the same pre uh, preventive intervention, but that are delivered more like uh, a passive display something that doesn't require the active engagement of the, of the participants. So that's, that's how we have usually been thinking about this uh, from, in terms of categorizing the interventions. Again, from the perspective of the capabilities that these sensors and the sensors to markers uh, I mean, uh, paradigm brings. Great. Well, Santos, I want to thank all the people who joined us on the phone. I think um, the some of the uh, research resources that you've made available, M. Cerebrum and some of the other open source software, that sort of thing, I think will be really interesting to a lot of people here. So um, I hope people will take advantage of that. And Santos, I want to thank you again for taking the time to do this today. It's much appreciated. Thank you so much, Bill. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.